My name is Rob Baer, and I'm one of the co-founders of Vilgar Africa, along with Wilford and Robert. Um, there, we're in our eighth year, and um, we're happy to announce also after this year, or sorry, after this session, we're going to have a bit of a cake cutting where we end, where we're going to announce and uh, and unveil our seven-year impact uh, report. We have an impact report that we're launching today, and so we're hoping that you uh, join us for the cake cutting after. Um, yes, I, I like that. It's, it's true. Um, one thing that's sort of special about Vilgro is that we, we are a demonstration. We were a startup. I think we're no longer a startup, but we started with nothing. And, and it was an idea. Yes, we had a kickstart from Vilgro India, but it didn't come with immediate funding. It was an idea to explore how to expand into Africa back in 2014. And, and that is since, since um, growing and developed to a broad range of partners and a strong team that we're super proud of that are committed to helping people um, improve health access and health care on the continent. Today is a session. We have a moderator that will guide us through, but my job is to welcome you, and we're glad you're here, and join us for some cake after this session. Thank you. I'll hand it over to the moderator. Thank you, Rob. Um, Karibuni sana. Uh, it's great to see you. For those of you who do not know what Karibuni is, welcome in Swahili. So, I know it's four o'clock because I've had a long day and you're like, okay, how exciting is it going to be? So we commit to you that you'll be as, as exciting as you want it to be. And how will we do that? So the first thing we want to do, we want to start off by asking you a question, and it will be on Mentimeter. How many of you have heard of Mentimeter before? Show of hands. So, excellent, so it's not a new, new thing, okay? So we would need you to log on, and I believe the instructions for how to do that should be coming up. So go to Mentimeter, menti.com, sorry, okay? And then once you're there, the code, are we there? Please use your phones by a show of hands. Let me know once you're at menti.com. And the question will be asking you, which will set the tone for this afternoon, is what challenges have you faced in accessing healthcare in your country? So we want to make it as personal as possible, as relatable as possible. Okay? You're there? Excellent. So the code is 22. Four eight three eight three nine. I will repeat. Two two four eight three eight three nine. Are we there? So for those of you who are working in Karibu, we are just kicking off, and uh, we are starting off with a little audience activity. So please. Get your phone out and go to menti.com. Menti.com. And the question, so I'll read the question and then the code once again. What challenges have you faced in accessing healthcare in your country? So if you're on menti.com, the code is 22483839. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Good. And we can see that uh, the answers are coming in. So thank you for that. So some of the answers for the panelists, I know this will be interesting for you, is one, lack of funding, long wait, long queues and follow-ups, and then poor data quality, Price transparency between insurance and providers. That means we do not know, you know what you're paying and what is being paid out. Affordability of care and quality of care. Affordability means, you know, when I go in, am I getting, am I able to access quality care? It's not enough that you are able to access care, but is it quality care, right? Long waits. How many of us have gone to a hospital and queued for an hour or two hours and had to cancel morning and afternoon appointments, right? So relatable for us, right? The other thing is cost. You know, it's said that uh, many of us on this side of the world are one terminal disease diagnosis away from poverty. 
Have you all had that before? I'm sure you have. We're in healthcare, right? So as soon as someone tells you my mother, my who is terminally, you know, diagonized with cancer or whatever else, then we start wondering how are we going to meet that cost? Yeah? So we'll keep that going in. And for those who are just coming last call, we said we are starting with a question for the audience about the challenges that you're faced in accessing healthcare in your country. So you go to menti.com and the code is 22483839. So we'll have that rolling, and then as that's going on, um, we will start off by introducing ourselves. Again, my name is Watau Gaeta. I'll be a moderator, and I'm really excited that you're here. And then we will start off um, here. Let's start with Emmanuel. Thank you very much, the moderator. My name is Emmanuel Kamuhire, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of LIT Uganda. So at LIT Uganda, we specialize in medical device development. Um, our device, the LIT Vein Locator, provides easy access to patients' veins, especially when um, in, in children, when um, clinicians are performing intravenous cannulation. Thank you so much, and I look forward to learning from everyone here. Hello, I'm Nicholas Koff. I'm the director of the Arcadius Foundation. Uh, we support uh, organizations that help businesses develop and grow in business development services, and uh, Villagro Africa is one of our partners. Hi, my name is Nao Monari. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Benacare Limited, which is a social enterprise in Kenya that is tackling the economic and emotional effects of long-term hospital stays for chronically ill patients and their families. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lubia Jaja William. I'm a clinician working with, with Wellspring Children's Medical Center in Uganda. Afternoon all, my name is Wilfred, co-founder CEO at Vigro Africa. We support early stage healthcare innovations like Elite, Benacare, who are also here in the panel. And our goal is to make sure that healthcare is not only accessible, but also affordable and high quality. Glad to have you all on this session. Thanks, Wilfred. Uh, David Higgins is my name uh, from Johnson & Johnson. Um, I sit within the Johnson & Johnson Impact Ventures team, which is the invest impact investing group uh, at Johnson & Johnson, and I lead all our work within the AME region, uh, particularly focused on, on East Africa. Thank you. A clap, please, for our panelists. <laughs> Asante. So we asked a question at the beginning. What are some of those challenges you faced? And this is for the panelists. So you heard about long queues. You heard about transparency in terms of what is being paid by the insurance and, and the providers. You've heard about the cost, yeah? And my question to you, and we can start, we'll start from um, gentlemen there. So we'll start with you uh, and ask you, what is your organization doing towards sustainable health? You're a clinician. You're right there in the front line. So you're both a patient, sometimes, hopefully not that often, if ever. But at the same time, you're also on this back end actually delivering that service to people who come and have been sitting in a queue waiting for one hour to come and see you. So what is your organization doing towards creating sustainability in healthcare? And you can speak you know, from your personal experience. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, this kind of question is not an easy question to answer, but uh, as a clinician, we just look at the financial status of the health center and uh, see how we are helping out onto these patients. But uh, remember, when we are giving a service, first of all, I work from uh, a non-profitable organization and when we are giving a service, we are looking at that very person who cannot afford a service. And all the non-profit organizations, they depend on donations. In most cases, the donations come when they are limited. The best thing we can do is to only stick on to what the donor instructs her to do with his or her money, and then we effect that so that next time, we are able to lob and get that little money, all the much money he or she is giving us. And then 
after realizing that there is a gap that we are realizing, next time when we are giving him or her a report about the funds he gave us, we have to include all the challenges that we faced so that maybe next time when he's giving us the money, there is an increment and then continue with the service. And then uh, we look at other investments like cost sharing. We look at the community in which we are working and uh, the money the donor is giving us. When we sell the idea of cost sharing to the donor and he or she, accepts us to do the cost sharing, we come back to our community and we tell them that, you know, this service has been costing, say, if you go to private entities, you'll find that you'll need to pay this amount of money to get a service. But when you come to us, you'll pay a subsidized cost of this amount and get a full service. So this money is kept aside so that in case the donor fails or gives us a little money, we are in position of using this money that we got from the patients and fulfill the service we are giving our clients. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, George, for making it so practical. So allow me to move over to David in response to also what George has said. So JNJ Impact Ventures is doing quite a bit of work um, and a bit of investment, especially in the healthcare industry. You know, so it would be interesting to one, understand, okay, you are working with frontline health workers as well, among other things, so maybe just mention what are the other things you're doing. But in response to what George is saying, you know, about supporting those who are actually offering the service, how, is, how are you doing that, number one? And uh, maybe which countries are you covering? Let's start with that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, happy to deal with that. So um, maybe talking in the broader sense initially, for, for Johnson & Johnson, um, so I sit with the, what's called the Global Community Impact Team, which is much bigger than Johnson & Johnson Impact Ventures, so, so there are two specific initiatives that the, the GCI group will actually be uh, uh, driving forward at this point. The first one is called the Centre for Health Worker Innovation, and my co colleague Anthony Guitao, who's actually attended the conference, is the, the local kind of driver of that initiative, and that is completely focused on frontline health workers, that's a $250 commitment, $250 million commitment, should I say, uh, to actually support a million uh, health workers out to 2030. Uh, and that's been underway now for, for the last two years. Um, we also focus on issues around racial inequity, which is very much sort of focused on our work uh, in, in the US, but is kind of broadening out. Um, but the last one, which is, is, is kind of where you're addressing the question to me, is around Johnson & Johnson Impact Ventures. So, I mean, listening to, the, to what's been sort of said, I mean, that, that resonates uh, very sort of strongly with, with the work that we're trying to do. Uh, our work is, is impact investment. So, I mean, what is impact investment? Impact investment is this notion of uh, providing capital to startups uh, where there is the opportunity not only to generate a financial return, but also to, to deliver some form of impact. And we see that in the truest sense, it is an investment. Uh, and, 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 and by seeing it as an investment, I think it drives um, the sustainability agenda, which is fundamental um, um, to how we do our work. So that means that as we look at opportunities that we screen, we don't uh, 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 invest in everything, uh, but that we invest in the ones that we really feel sort of stand out. And, and the ones that kind of really hit home for us really sort of tick a couple of boxes. One is uh, uh, the quality of the offering. Uh, and I don't think... Uh, what I've seen to date suggests that you can only sort of see quality in high-end sort of products. I mean, there are many fantastic organizations uh, enabling access to healthcare uh, with delivering so that, that access at the highest levels of kind of quality. Uh, the, the next thing for us really is clearly a business model and a sustainable business model. Uh, that's got to be built on many, many kind of levers that actually drive forward that kind of business model. Uh, and the, 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 including the kind of price point that allows uh, a, a larger populations to actually access that healthcare. Uh, and most of the models that we support, I say so all of the models that we support, uh, um, come in at price points uh, that offer services uh, to um, the, the underserved populations and, and many others 
um, um, and allow them to sort of scale their kind of business model kind of going forward. And then the last one really, and it's, it's the, the most fundamental one in terms of kind of getting us over the line as an investor, is really sort of seeing the, the caliber and quality of that entrepreneur by plan and, and, and the management team that's behind that entrepreneur. So I, I fully believe that by the work that we do in driving sustainable business models, you actually allow the delivery of quality healthcare that enables access to greater levels of population across the continent. Thank you so much, David. And for those of you who are just walking in, uh, we are spending some time talking about sustainable uh, healthcare in Africa and how we can make that happen. And we started off uh, with George and talking about what he's doing uh, from his organization. Then we went to um, Nicholas and he's talking about a lot, sorry, David, more about you know what they have done as impact ventures and in terms of what it is that they're supporting. But I really like how you ended up with in terms of seeing the quality of entrepreneurs. And on that note, I want to move over to one of these beneficiaries. Now, tell us a little bit more about how this has impacted you. What is it that you're doing? And how have you seen this support and what has it enabled you as an organization to support sustainable business practices in healthcare in Africa? Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for, for that. Uh, so what Benacare is doing is uh, we are solving the high cost of care. And uh, as we spoke here, I think the biggest challenge that uh, we face is the very high cost of care in, in Kenya and even in Africa. And the problem with the high cost of care is that it has this trickle-down effect to the quality of care that you will receive, uh, even the quality of interactions that you will have with your healthcare providers, the kind of information that you will receive from the healthcare providers uh, pertaining your diagnosis. It has a lot of issues when it comes to um, very expensive healthcare that people that, uh, cannot afford. Uh, so what we are doing is we are solving this by building a large network of healthcare workers who are qualified. And through this network, we are able to connect them to patients that are in need of care at home. And uh, through the connection, these uh, healthcare workers are able to deliver quality and affordable care to the patient's own homes. And uh, we also systematically lower the cost of care by facilitating exchange of used home care equipment like hospital beds and oxygen concentrators between the families. And uh, most importantly, we are empowering families and their patients uh, to take care of themselves through uh, sufficient health education, as well as skills uh, on, on uh, you know, the basic uh, caregiving processes. Now, the support that we have received from our partners at J&J uh, &J, uh, through Vilgro Africa and other partners like the Making More Health Accelerator has helped us to tap into the very low income markets because uh, when we started off, our price point was around 15 USD per day. Now, this is not very affordable to even 70% of the population right now because, again, the economy is really bad. Uh, so through the support, we are able to introduce a, a service where uh, people in the low-income areas and um, uh, informal settlements, uh, probably underserved markets, are able to be trained uh, as family caregivers and offer care to their patients and get to pay around 2 USD per day for this service where we just come for service monitoring and uh, clinical care. So I believe the support that we are receiving is going a very long way towards creating accessibility to care in terms of affordability uh, because uh, it's not accessible if it's not affordable. Even if it is next door, it's, it's not. Wow, excellent. It's not accessible even if it's... I'm waiting to see if you're listening. It's not accessible? Excellent. And just before I move on to the next question, David, in response to what Naum has shared, are these the kind of entrepreneurs who are really supporting the vision? Is this what you're looking for um, when you go out into the country, when you're looking to support and to grow? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, um, one of the things that totally excites me about working in this space is getting to work with entrepreneurs. The, uh, I mean, because, I mean, they are visionaries. They deal with so many sort of challenges, so many sort of difficulties. So I always feel um, um, very lucky 
to, to be able to work kind of with those entrepreneurs. I think w as investors, we can for sure, we can make their life difficult. I mean, it's challenging and I mean, what they expect of us as an investor is sometimes we can be supportive, sometimes we can be challenging, but I mean, we're always there to help and sort of move things sort of forward. But totally, I mean, that's, that's what it's all, as I said earlier, for us, it always comes down to the entrepreneur. Excellent, thank you, David. Norm made reference to the cost uh, of getting quality uh, care. And she also talked about the beds. So I would just want to a minute just go back to in Kenya when we had COVID at its height. I think the one thing that most people are looking for, if you are unfortunate to have someone who was very sick and needed oxygen, was just getting one, a bed in a hospital, two, an oxygen tank. And those became one of the things that you could not afford. I mean, forget gold. That was life and death, right? So when she talks about it and the fact that you can also be able to make that affordable, but even more importantly, have somebody at home taking care of you so that I could have the bed and the oxygen tank, but I don't know what to do, right? And that's what Naomi is doing. By building the quality of those healthcare providers, they can be able to then, you can then be able to have access to affordable quality care. And on that note, I want to move to Emmanuel. <laughs> We've talked about the other side of it and getting treatment, but let's also come back to the back end, the supply chain. I don't know how it was in Kampala, but here, just getting a few items, you know, going to the pharmacy, you can go see your doctor, but to actually get either the medicines or the devices is a very difficult thing, especially in some of the uh, public hospitals, you know, depending on the level. So I want to hear from your experience, what have been some of those challenges that you've experienced uh, back in Uganda? Um, thank you very much. So um, first of all, I'm going to um, address this challenge in uh, the medical perspective, like medical device perspective. So um, now medical device industry is something that is really um, highly regulated. So as one of the developers of medical devices, um, the biggest challenge in, in supply chain that you know we have come across is um, around regulatory compliance. Now I want to put it in perspective, especially in Africa. So looking at Africa as a continent, you're looking at over 50 countries. And even when you have, um, say, this device working in one country, um, the, the, the regulations and the standards that are required actually different in the other African countries. So it means that you have a device which is giving service in a particular country, but you can't actually do it in a, in a different, in a neighboring country. Say, for example, uh, look at Uganda. So if it's working in Uganda, you can actually bring it to Kenya for it to, you know, give the same service. So that becomes um, a huge uh, kind of challenge, and I believe uh, Vilgo Africa with partners could actually um, uh, work on a model where if a device is working in Kenya, it's actually acceptable. Um, um, all over Africa. And of course, how we are able to go about that, and I want to appreciate Vilgro's efforts to, you know, making sure that they invest in our team to learn on how to, um, you know, develop documentation around, um, you know, approvals. So to acquire like um, FDA approval or CE mark, so that um, at least you have a top down kind of approach. So if this has a CE mark, then you're able to, you know, like sell across Africa, across Europe, and stuff like that. So that is, um, you know, been a very huge uh, barrier when it comes to supply chain. And then the other part, which of course brings in a bit of delays, is um, like I'm, I'm also going to base on the medical device industry. Uh, so you have different, let's say, for example, the Elite vein locator. We're using two different kind of components. So you have the electronics bit, you have the mechanical bit. And some of these um, components are not readily available. So maybe you have to um, do a thing of, let me just do this, uh, some bit of shipping uh, of maybe one of the components. So um, some of the suppliers would just like, you know, you order for, let's say, maybe a kind of battery. And this supplier thinks you actually need a different battery. And then he sends a battery which you didn't even order for. And that's like one month down the road. So the battery reaches. And then when you check, it cannot, you know, um, it's not compatible with your device. And then you have to get back to them and say, hey, you know, this is not what I, <laughs> I had to order for. So, I mean, it's, so that delay brings in a bit of uh, you're losing money, you're losing time, you're losing a lot um, in, 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 in terms of that. And then um, maybe at a, at a local level, at a country level, um, you have, like, I'm going to use Uganda as an example, you have a country that doesn't have standards when it comes to medical device development. So you have to, you know, like, do a bit of benchmarking on um, other you know, established 
uh, you know, standards from other countries or other you know, continents for you to come and convince the local market that you know what, this actually fulfills what these people are saying and we believe it can actually get on market. So, so many issues. Uh, very many, but we can keep discussing as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Um, sorry to go back to COVID. Uh, it reminds me, Uganda came up with this COVID vaccine that was working in Uganda, yeah. but it could not dare cross the borders into Kenya. Yeah. But if you went to Uganda, you would have been healed and come home. You know? But it's interesting when it talks about regulation on what's acceptable in one country and is not in another country. That's just a very recent example. And um, Emmanuel has called on Wilfred, and he said, these are some of the challenges they're facing. Regulation, compatibility. So let's talk a little bit about you know, Vilgro and what you're doing what, in terms of addressing some of these gaps, building capacities. Are there things you're doing across uh, the countries to standardize? Um, over to you, Wilfred. Thanks for that question. And before I answer that one, um, allow me to build on what uh, Emmanuel said about uh, this that word he used, delay. And in a healthcare setup, we also use that word a lot, eh? where we say there are three delays to actually accessing care. Uh, the first delay is to decide that you're gonna go and get care, which most of the time happens when you don't have financial resources, for example, then you're gonna delay and push it to tomorrow. Or if going to the facility is gonna cost you income, or you're gonna lose income for the day if you are a small shopkeeper, then you're gonna delay, right, to go seek care. Uh, after that, after you've come that delay, the second delay becomes the distance to go and access care, right? So you've made a decision, you're gonna go get care, but it's very far away from you, right? So you're gonna again wonder, should I take a 200, 300 kilometer journey, or should I postpone again? And then the third delay happens when you've shown up at the facility, and when you are there, you realize that they don't have the equipment, like what Airlight is building, they don't have supply chain, they don't have medicine, they don't have drugs, so you're gonna get delayed further in actually getting that care. And these delays, only leads to you having very adverse outcomes in your, in your healthcare. I think there are many things in life that you can put on hold and come back better, like a relationship or your career. <laughs> but healthcare, you can't put it on hold, right? When you put it on hold, then you get a very much uh, adverse outcome. Um, now back to your question on how we support uh, people like uh, Naomi and, and, and Emmanuel. Uh, one is that uh, we help them na navigate the regulatory hurdles. We've mapped the regulatory landscape across East Africa. I think we were the first ones to do so in a way that we tell you what, the, what are the regulatory steps you need to take when you're in Uganda, what are the steps you need to take when you're in uh, Kenya, what are the steps you need to take when you're in Ethiopia, and we've worked with uh, inventors and innovators across those uh, geographies. And the funny thing is that the process is not the same. It changes from country to country. <laughs> I see Emmanuel smiling. Because whatever I dealt with in Uganda, when it comes to Kenya, is a different ball game. So uh, what we've done is we've tried to help them map these uh, regulatory hurdles ahead of time so that you know what you're getting into. At the same time, there are other initiatives to harmonize that. That is being done at ecosystem level, uh, beyond what Viogro does. That is being done by regulators themselves. I know there's an initiative by GIZ to harmonize at least at a East Africa level. I think the next level is to go uh, uh, Africa level. I think there's a, a regional body already at Africa level that will harmonize so that you get one regulatory approval, allows you to sell anywhere in the continent. Uh, the other thing we offer is technical assistance, right? You've built such, such a nice device, but you assume that it's gonna fly off the door once you, once you put it in the market, which that doesn't happen, right? So we help them come up with these go-to-market strategies by speaking to the needs of the customer. We are very intentional by starting with a needs assessment. We wanna know who are your target customers to start with? Uh, is it government? Is it international NGO? Is it private sector? What are their needs? Which speaks to also what are their purchasing patterns, the procurement policies, which then allows you to package uh, your service solution to them, right? In some cases, we've had to do PPP. Uh, we had an, one example in Oxygen, where the go-to-market strategy was actually doing a private-public partnership with county governments to allow uptake of Oxygen. 
Otherwise, it would have been very uh, cumbersome for them if without the PPP, because then you have to wait uh, several months to get paid, right? You have to, you have to, you have to go through a very rigorous procurement process, and then after that, you have to spend the rest of your life chasing to get paid. So we help them navigate some of these things as part of go-to-market strategy. Um, the other thing we do is linkages with investors, and that's why we have David here from JJ Impact Ventures and Nicholas fr from Agidius, where we see how do we then unlock further funding for these startups. At Vilgro, we only give you about 50,000 to maybe 100,000 maximum, but then you're gonna need millions of dollars. So how do we prepare you, make you investable and ready and introduce you to these downstream investors. Uh, those are just some of the ways that we, we are able to support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wilfred. And you've talked about your partnership with Agidius, and that is where I wanted to go next. To understand, you know, I'm um, from you, uh, Nicholas. Why are you then working with, uh, you know, Vilgro in this uh, specific case? And uh, so that's one in terms of how you're looking to supporting them, you know, as a, in, in the area of social impact. But number two as well, it's because we, we are aware that beyond healthcare, you know, you are in other industries and sectors. And what are some of those uh, practices, sustainable practices that we could borrow, you know, and be able to scale uh, within the, the healthcare industry? Um, yes, um, so it's great to be here. Um, so just a correction to Wilfred. Um, I'm not an investor, so, <laughs> so please don't ask me. <laughs> go, to, go to David, He's, go to him <laughs> over there. Uh, so Agidius is a, is a foundation which is really interested in uh, the non-financial support that businesses need to grow and develop over time. And we've spent the last uh, 10 years um, finding out what were the key characteristics of effective business development services. And I'm pleased to say that Vilgro was one of our partners in that uh, and are one of the case studies in, 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 in the subsequent tools and reports we've produced, which has an acronym so to work in development called SCALE. So SCALE are a set of characteristics which a good quality business development support organization should have uh, in some degree in order to be able to create impact. So um, that was the first important piece. And we wanted to support um, uh, Villagro Africa um, because um, it fitted for us to look at a sector specific, um, very early stage uh, incubator that blended um, the kinds of support that Wilfred has described and to see and test uh, the effectiveness of that kind of approach uh, and benchmark it against other approaches, including more generic approaches to helping businesses grow and develop. And I think there's room, obviously, for both. Um, but it's important that in the ecosystem, uh, we have business support that enables businesses in general to thrive, uh, that are sector agnostic, but we also need uh, specific uh, support, around, particularly around uh, sectors like health, where policy and regulation are critical, and navigating those are critical to enabling those businesses uh, to grow and develop o over time. And so our partners over the last seven or eight years have supported about 45,000 businesses, um, mostly in East Africa and, and Central America. Um, about um, uh, 2,000 of those are in the health sector, um, broadly described. Um, most of those have gone through generic support rather than specific support. And I suspect if they could now, or we had more opportunities for specific support, you'd see faster growth rates and faster development precisely because they're navigating the environment. Excellent, thank you. So for those of you who just uh, came in a bit later when we had started, we are looking at uh, you know, affordable, sustainable business practices. Um, in healthcare in Africa, and we started off by asking, what are some of those challenges that you have seen or experienced personally? And some of the ones that were raised were around very long queues, cost, quality, 
you know, it's, it's one thing to afford to walk into a private hospital or a public one, but also the quality of service that you're getting, both from the individual, the doctors, the clinicians, or even, you know, uh, the medication you walk out with. So these are some of the things we've been addressing, and importantly, from all angles. So we are looking at those who are investing in entrepreneurs like uh, Naom. We are looking at those who are supporting entrepreneurs as well. And we're also looking at the supply chain. So that said, I think we've spoken just a bit in, more than enough for now. We want to hand it over back to you to hear from you. Just a couple of questions. What do you think of what it is that you've had? Are we hearing what you were expecting when you walked in here? Are there other practices you know, that you feel you know, you've experienced in other areas that we should be thinking about uh, within the healthcare industry. So I'm sure we do have a, ro do we have a roving mic? We could use one, we could use mine. Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, Bill. I'm a social enterprise intrapreneur from Amref Health Innovations and happy to be part of these discussions. I uh, would really be keen on uh, understanding the role of uh, social insurance in this uh, uh, model uh, that was uh, tested, because even as we try to talk about sustainable uh, financing of healthcare, how do we protect the underserved by minimizing the out-of-pocket expenditures beyond uh, cost sharing, but also how have we attempted to involve the social insurer in all that. And while we address that also, perhaps in Uganda, do we have um, uh, social insurance safety nets? Like in Kenya, we have the likes of Linda Mama, Edu Afia, which is just pools of money that are, have been made available by government but when you don't have supply side readiness, you find that uh, facilities which are not supply side ready, simply because there are not enough investments done there, are not activated well enough to be able to access those. And if they can't access the funds from the social safety nets, then these benefits cannot get down to the very people that we are targeting at the bottom of the pyramid they underserved. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Derek. I um, run a makerspace. So my question is first to Emmanuel. Um, within the space of medical device production, I know one of the challenges, since this is an area that is highly regulated, even as you said, one of the issues also comes in at the point of manufacturing and large-scale production. Um, that part also needs to be highly regulated because these are medical devices. So even for your products, the products that you are developing, um, maybe you can share with us the plans that you have in terms of manufacturing, uh, the, manuf the production phase. But also the same question goes to Vilgro. I'm wondering whether Vilgro is doing anything around that to map out how innovators can be able to do production of their medical devices because I know our country doesn't exactly have a, an existing medical device production industry. So the very few players that are there, um, are we doing anything perhaps to map them and how uh, can, can innovators be able to tap into that to, to be able to get their innovations out there? Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Moses Wawero, and I'm part of the Vilgro team. My question picks up from Derek's question, and it's around the market. And I would address it to Nicholas and um, David. What would you say are some of the best practices you've seen seated where you are, like at a global level, in terms of boosting adoption of innovations and technologies? Uh, it could be in the health sector or also from other sectors that we could learn from. Thank you. Um, was Bill, and talks about safety, uh, social safety nets. And I think, I'm not sure whether Wilfred won't tackle this one. There's one, of course, Emmanuel, we were asked whether you have the same as NHIF in Kenya. 
Um, so you could maybe start by responding to that. Wilfred, will you take tackle? Um, Maybe George. George. Okay. The role of social social insurance. insurance. Maybe as, as, as George uh, organizes his thoughts, I will think I'll, I'll respond to one experiment that uh, I believe Bill we were together uh, in Makueni. So there was one social scheme called Makueni Care that Amref was piloting there together with Phillips and uh, invited by Bill, I was able to go and tour and see what $5, was it $5 a year? A $5 a year type of a scheme and what it could do in terms of increasing access to healthcare, especially those that were not in the national scheme. And you could see that because this was a county focused scheme, reinforced for the county, we, we had a lot of neighboring people from the Mas neighboring region of Maasai crossing over and they would be denied care because they were not members of this county, right? So uh, building on that, what we've seen in Uganda, which is what uh, maybe George can add here, um, we've worked with one company called uh, Streamline, which is in the southern part of Uganda. Uh, they have this scheme which is about a dollar, I think a dollar a month or something. Very affordable, you can imagine a dollar a month, but the scheme is a social scheme. That means they are not looking to, to be profitable. The, at best, they want to break even. So if you have like 500,000 uh, members each paying a dollar, uh, already you have what, $500,000 a month, right? And you're not using this money uh, over and above. You don't have things like claims administration. You don't have uh, uh, like money going to any underwriter. They're, it's a self-managed scheme which Streamline provides a tech platform that allows you to do the administration of this scheme. And all of a sudden, you have these mothers that then can come deliver without having to worry about payment. Uh, what was very interesting about that is that they even able to offer, I remember one of the sites we visited, and the pregnant mothers were coming from another village across the valley, and they were able to even offer them accommodation at the facility way before the labor kicks in, because the danger in these parts, if labor kicks in at night, there's no transportation. It's a hilly place. There are no roads, so either the mother could, you could lose the mother or the child. So they tell them a week before, from the dollar a month that you are paying, we can still accommodate you here uh, as you wait uh, for, 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 your, for your labor. So some of these are just examples of social insurance schemes uh, that people can innovate over and beyond what government is able to do uh, in order to increase uh, access to care. And I don't know whether, George, you have something to add. Thank you very much. Actually, you can find that uh, most of our governments cannot really stand the burden that uh, there is in the field out there just because of the finances. But you can find that there are some organizations that have come up to look into this and they have helped in a way. I'm going to cite examples of two organizations where I stay in Uganda, and um, to start with my very organization. There are 1,000 shillings paid each for each child who attends the clinic is put aside to make sure that this money helps the other child who will come into the medical center and, can, and cannot afford to pay the 1,000 shillings be it to be managed at the center or to be taken or transferred to another hospital for management. So after assessing this, that this child cannot, be, cannot do the payment for the medical care, then the medical center goes into its pockets and you find this child to hospitals for medication. You find that there is another hospital that is in Eastern Uganda, Chua Children's Hospital, it's a neurological hospital for children. You go there, there is a subsidized cost you pay for that child. But that amount of money is working on your child for a year. And this money will have to feed your child while in the hospital, do the surgeries and the medication required for the full year. Whether the there is a reoccurrence of the complication the child went with, they have to 
be using the same amount of money. And they reached a time when it's like they're overwhelmed with the conditions and uh, they had to look into their pockets and said, you know, all the children coming with neurological conditions, all their hospital bills have been paid for. So just send in the patients and they will be worked on because we already have the funds to manage these children. So the, some organizations, if they can look into helping the governments of ours in doing such a thing, then you can be really sure that at least there is some kind of safety and lives can be saved in that way. Emmanuel, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Just to sum up what, uh, what they're saying. Um, so the question was, do we have like a national um, you know, kind of insurance scheme for like in Uganda? Uh, that one, we don't really have it, but we have like, you know, community-based uh, kind of uh, insurance schemes where a particular group of people, um, you know, um, organize and come up with a scheme that really works um, uh, for them in terms of when they have issues. So, I have, of course, I've seen this in, in, you know, neighboring counties like Rwanda, where they have, uh, like, a fund where a family pays 3000 per child, per person in a family, and this, you know, like, you know, helps them. And I think it could be something that maybe Uganda also uh, in future take up, uh, but for now, it's not there. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I hope you're satisfied. Great. The second question, um, Derek, and it was specifically for Emmanuel, and he was asking about manufacturing at a large scale and the quality um, that goes with that. Um, if you could respond to that. And then for Wilfred, the question is, what are you doing in regards of ensuring that you can scale out the innovations that are coming out um, in the same sector? Thank you very much, and uh, that's really a great question. Uh, first of all, if you have to like, engage into medical device um, you know, manufacturing, you're required by standards to, you're supposed to meet ISO, uh, that is ISO 13485. So that, that means if, you're, if you are to put um, a medical device to the market, then you must be able to um, uh, show documentation that a supplier who gave you maybe, say, a battery for the device is actually ISO 13485 certified. Uh, the person who did the assembly were looking at actually working with uh, Revital Health in Kenya, and these could actually even, you know, uh, do the helping in terms of assembling at a local level. But, and these, of course, are, you know, ISO 14, um, uh, 13485 certified. But every person in, 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 in the chain, you know, must really meet that requirement. So um, for medical device, uh, manufacturing, you really don't have to say, oh, you see this one also was so close to this. No, that really doesn't, you know, work. Um, so you must make sure that every person who handles, let it be the one who is uh, doing this, uh, the board designing, like the PCB design or layout. They just have to be working with a company that is, you know, ISO uh, 13485 certified. And that really has to, you know, like, um, you know, move along uh, all the stages till when you get to the point of supplying the device. So, uh, like I said, of course, this is, you know, um, highly regulated, but it's very important because you're dealing with life. And so if you compromise one of the processes, then it means you could actually use this device on a patient. And before we know, the life, uh, life is gone. So we begin blaming other, um, you know, people when it's actually from the device. So that's, that's, that's basically what it is. Thank you. Yeah. In addition to that, uh, as we grow, what we do, first of all, is capacity building around the ISO, the tinfoil. 85. We've had uh, four companies, in, including Airlight and Simbona, which is also in the room, go through this type of training on ISO standards and QMS because med, med device sector is highly regulated. It's very rigorous. You have to do all your documentation and cross all the T's. So we, we, we work with external players to build that capacity. But then going back to Derek's question on manufacturing or production, uh, we can't build production facilities ourselves, but we can help map, including the likes of Revital Health that has been mentioned here, including other makerspace. We are happy to co uh, uh, collaborate with you if you have that capacity at your makerspace. And then I think we need a holistic ecosystem view and look at who's doing what and also see how we can uh, have specialization. If some people are more focused on PCB boards and electric circuits, 
let them specialize in that line. If others are more focused on the on the casing, let let us map who is focused on casing. Others are focused on packaging. So I think it will take a village. Uh, we are happy to collaborate with you and other partners for sure, uh, because this is a non-existent in in the country. Most people often will have to ship it off uh, to China and other places f after they've designed it for it to be manufactured. Yeah. Great, thank you. I hope your question has been answered. The last question was, uh, the third one was from Moses. Um, and he's talk he was asking directly to David and Nicholas about the different practices they have seen uh, across the sectors that can be borrowed uh, and skilled um, on this side in, in the healthcare uh, sector. So maybe we could start with you, Nicholas. Um, yes, in terms of building markets. Um, I would say the first principle is um, never, never overestimate your knowledge of your customer or your market space, and which is consistent, and and it, you can consistently not satisfactorily segment that space intelligently and clearly. My favourite example: um, the money that Argidia spends comes from a wealthy Dutch family who, since the 1840s, have been selling clothes. So they sell clothes, they're in their sixth generation, and they sell clothes across Europe and, and Latin America and Asia. And um, about three years ago, they were redesigning their stores in, in Europe. And one of their insights, one of their customer insights, was that 80% of all clothes are bought by women, irrespective of who they're being bought for. So they may be being bought for men as well as women. Now, this came as a revelation to them. Now, they've been selling clothes for 150 years, 150 years plus years, and nobody had yet figured out this really simple piece of customer information about how is it that clothes get bought, who buys them, and therefore how you should design the stores to enable that experience to be reflected in the, in the process. So I think again and again, I think it's a question of um, uh, uh, being really clear about your customer segment and really clear that you understand them, and really clear that you probably don't. Uh, and that there's always more to understand about them as you go forward. So another example from Kenya, uh, we've worked with uh, KCB, which is Kenya's obviously largest uh, commercial bank. Um, and we've designed, helped them design their first ever loan product, uh, which is for SMEs, and which is not collateralized. So it's cash flow based lending product. They thought, when we started on this, that they were going to break into new markets with this product. But actually, when we started with, when we started with them and we looked at their data, they had a million SME, SMM SME clients already with the bank, only 6% of which were being earmarked as business clients. The other 94% were being earmarked as private clients. And the two sections of the bank didn't talk to each other. So they had all of this financial data on a million firms, which they weren't able to use to make credit decisions against this new product. Now, once they're able to do that, they've now lent $500 million against that product over the last three years, and it's their second most profitable product in the bank. But if you'd asked them four years ago, five years ago, who, is, who are we targeting? they would not have been able to answer that question, and the answer they would have tried to give would have been completely wrong. And yet they're sitting on that information and all of that data, which they weren't using effectively to be able to develop their second most profitable product in the bank. Wow, very interesting. David. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, well, I can only speak from healthcare because that is, that is our focus, so I'm not able to kind of glean any learnings from, from other sort of specific sectors. But, uh, I mean, the, the most transformational uh, thing that I've seen in the last years really is what's happened as a direct result of COVID. And I'm not talking about vaccines and things. I'm talking about the, the role that technology has actually played in those last number of years. I mean, the scale at which the offerings around technology have, have, have built up has been phenomenal. It's, it's evidence within each of the organizations, the adoption rates within sort of technology on a mass scale uh, is actually quite sort of staggering to see. And, and the more and more I work with many of the companies within our own portfolio that didn't start life, and this sort of builds on what Nicholas just sort of said, they didn't start life necessarily as 
a company with some kind of a technology platform that were doing something very, very different, they realize that actually the, the actual technology that, that, that sort of sits within what they do, whether it's a, a platform that allows them to kind of gather information or glean insights or whatever that may be, uh, I mean, is very relevant as they move and kind of pivot their business model uh, into, into the future. Uh, but, but what I would sort of say in my own experience, and it's a short experience in, in the impact investment space is uh, that, you know, I, I come from Europe. We have what I would sort of regard as bloated uh, health systems that are not always the most uh, efficient by any means. And I think I have seen and spoken to entrepreneurs in this continent who are developing solutions that I think are going to deliver solutions within this continent, but they're also going to deliver solutions that are going to be effective uh, uh, globally. So I would love to think that there are people in this room at this sort of conference who actually are going to be spearheading the technology and solutions to delivery of healthcare that's going to make the difference kind of, kind of globally. I, I really believe that's going to happen. Oh, excellent. Are you? Are you in the room? Are you in the room? No, you must be in the room. That's why you're here, right? So I'm going to ask, take a few more questions from the audience. And as the mic goes round, I'll ask Naum one question. Um, you're extending accessible quality healthcare into homes. And you've talked about the quality of that caregiver, right? How do you ensure that you know, a nurse uh, in Nairobi you know, is doing the same thing as a nurse in Kampala or a nurse in Wajir? And they're not all doing, you know, maybe they're look, uh, taking care of a patient who is diabetic. How do you ensure that they're following the same guidance and protocols? And that one, somewhere, you know, is not just dispensing medications and the other one really is not there at all. How do you tighten that to ensure quality? Thank you. Uh, thankfully, the Nursing Council of Kenya is pretty strict on the training protocols. And uh, so once a nurse is qualified, then they know the protocol. Now, what we are dealing with is the character of the nurse. If they would, uh, you know, purposefully just not give the medication or not. Uh, so what we have been doing is we have collaborated with um, with a company, um, MDoc in Nigeria, that offers uh, tele-education, uh, more like continuous medical education for healthcare workers, and they are offering this for free to our nurses, okay? And so when this happens monthly, we speak about diabetes, we speak about high blood pressure, and other conditions that they manage at home uh, are more like to build their competence. But aside from that, uh, in our app, we have uh, a rating system where the client themselves can rate these nurse as uh, one star to five star. And then we know we, we're, not gonna <laughs> uh, we're not gonna employ these nurse again uh, in the house because of this. Uh, but mostly what has come up uh, when we send nurses to people's homes is not the clinical side of things. It's the social side of things uh, because home care at home is very intimate with the family and that is why uh, through our app we try as much as possible to match these nurses to clients uh, according to specifications, uh, specifications like gender, uh, religion. Religion is very important for some of the people, especially when uh, they have terminal illness. Even tribe, uh, because sometimes we have our grandmothers at 90 years old who, who are not very comfortable with Kiswahili or English, and so they would require a nurse uh, who can speak the language. So we look at all those aspects as we send the nurse home, and then we, we also have a training on how to gel at home, because this training is not in schools yet is not in the training schools. Uh, you know, we are taught on how to give care at the bedside in the hospital, and after administering the medication, you go back to the nursing station, and some of them just pull off even earphones. Uh, but when you're home, it's totally different because you're taking care of uh, all aspects of this patient, and sometimes you can become like a daughter to them when they can even send you to the shop. You're not going to say, that's not in my job description. Uh, so... It's just social uh, problems, and I hope that there should be a shift uh, uh, towards the training that we receive in uh, nursing schools uh, to also teach us on how to, to offer home-based uh, care. Wow. Excellent. She deserves a clap, no? Very well done. 
Good. So we can take a couple more questions from the audience, if there are some. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks to the panel for the excellent presentation. My name is uh, Paul Nyandika from uh, Boringa Engelheim, good partner to Vilgro. Um, one thing that I keep uh, hearing is there is some systematic problems, right, within the healthcare system. And when I look at the entrepreneurs, they're also providing a kind of a standalone solutions, right? So uh, this question goes to Wilfred. Uh, if we are going to address a systematic problem, there is so much that the social entrepreneurs working alone can do to solve a systematic problem. So from Vilgro's perspective, um, is there something that you have in mind or uh, within your probably thought process to create a systematic solution so that we move away from all these idiosyncratic single standalone solutions so that maybe when we come here in the next seven years we'll move away from transformative healthcare business model for sustainable impact but rather transformative healthcare business model for systemic impact yeah and then we can move the middle and we can move the needle more so is there something that uh, you're working on and top of my mind uh, I'm just looking at Agidius there I'm looking at J&J uh, &J, I'm looking at Boringa here, are you thinking of something that can really bring out some systemic solution by bringing all these people together? Any other? Or oh, Wilfred, you want to take that? Yeah. <laughs> now that you mentioned it, I'm beginning to think about it. <laughs> it's, it's not something we've already crafted, but you're right. Uh, there are all these partners which are, we, we are all thinking silos, right? So when we talk to j and it's more about access to, to healthcare. We talk to Sanofi, they'll tell you they are more focused on NCDs. You talk to Boringa, they'll tell you that we are in this area. So I think Vilgro has a role, a unique role to be aggregator of these different partners. We're already beginning to, to see that and hopefully next year we'll have something. And it can take a form of an event to start with where we bring all these partners in healthcare uh, because it's not just entrepreneurs that are not talking to each other, it's also the global health players, right? At the top, each of them has their own vertical and they don't speak to each other, right? There are those that are focused on supply chain. Another one will tell you, we only think about TB and malaria, we don't want to hear about anything else. Others will say we are focused on maternal and child health. And I think as uh, we can play the role of an, a convener, aggregator, and I hope when we send the invite to Boringa, you, you're gonna you're gonna show up for the for the event, yeah. But thanks for that question. Thank you, Wilfred. Any other question from the audience? You've had so many inspiring stories and ways that we could uh, one bring those ideas you have in mind to life. Oh, here you go, Derek. Yeah, just one last question. <laughs> So he's talked about systemic challenges, and I remembered uh, one of the things that affects innovators is, uh, I don't know whether it's a social or it's an attitude problem, um, and this goes to Naum and, uh, and Emmanuel, and maybe um, the team can also support on how we go about this, but we have an attitude issue. When someone has come up with, a, let's say, a medical device, um, whenever you're going to buy even a wheelbarrow at home, if it, if it has been branded made in Japan, that's the one you want. You think this quality is up there. If it says made in Kenya, some place at Gikomba, you're not very sure that is the one you need to go back home with. And the same thing I'm assuming even to um, what Naum is doing. If the nurse is coming home, this grandmother feels, if I went to the hospital, now I know I'm accessing care. But if this person is coming to my home, am I really getting the, uh, the real deal? So I'm just wondering what, what could be the solution around this kind of um, attitude? Is it something that policy can help? How do we support innovators and makers to be able to push their products through the market despite the attitudes that uh, our communities have around us being innovators or producers of our own solutions? Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Maybe we can hear from Naomi and Emmanuel if they have encountered people who don't want their nurses because for one reason or the other. Let's start with Naomi. Yeah, that happens a lot. Uh, that absolutely happens a lot. And I think it's just a perennial problem. 
tagged to uh, more like cultural, um, and we need cultural transformation on that one for us to move forward. But even before that, I really don't think policy will affect how we want to accept uh, new uh, things, you know, made in Kenya and everything, uh, because I believe the law might, might make you not kill me, but it cannot make you like me. Okay, so there is that part. Uh, but again, I believe that it is our responsibilities, the players in the market, it is our responsibility to change how people look at us. Uh, so if, for example, we push for more regulation on what we are doing, because something like home nursing has not had regulation for a very long time in Kenya. Even in 2017 when I was starting off, um, there was nothing. I could go to their offices and they're like, so you're doing what? Okay, so why are you sending nurses home? It was just too much and there's no regulations. But if we push the government or the people involved to put down regulations so that people feel like this sector is properly regulated and get even insurance on board, like uh, you know the, the health insurance providers on board, uh, then we will start changing the way people look at us. Because when uh, we were starting off and we could approach, um, uh, you know, stakeholders to try and see if we can partner, it was very hard to even get through the doors. Nowadays, all we have to do is do a pitch deck and write our partners, Boeing, Inglaheim, Vilgro, Africa, and then our pitch deck just goes through, okay, because of the partners that we have had on board. So I, I, I feel like it's, it is up to us to change how they feel about us. It's, it's not a policy thing. Manu. Um, thank you very much. So mine doesn't really differ from what she says. Uh, I'll talk about like two things. One, branding. Um, you know, the way the, the population looks at your product is also um, um, partly attributed to how you do the branding. And the other part is we talk about medical devices, and most of the times you hear people say low-cost alternatives. So being a low-cost doesn't necessarily mean you have to uh, compromise on quality, because we've seen, you know, like you buy a chair, and then just because it's, uh, it's low-cost, and then one or two days you sit on it, and it's broken. I mean, we, we have to look at, um, if we have to compete, for example, based on price, then let the price also be reflected, uh, reflected in the quality of the device that you're putting out there. And that's why I'm telling you that when it comes to medical devices, the regulations are putting um, like, you know, stringent means in a way that though you're coming up with something that is a bit probably maybe low cost, that can be af uh, affordable to your community, but they want to look at is it uh, delivering quality. Otherwise, there's no way you can convince someone to believe in your product um, when they have 10 products already that uh, you you marketed them by saying they can last five years, this is going to work in this way. And the 10 customers are saying, hey, I bought this device from this guy and only two days it was you know, not functioning. So I think we have, as innovators, to think about um, quality and also think about how are we branding our items. You know, that really matters a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, may I dare add one thing, and I'm not an expert, but word of mouth and credibility. If you have a nurse who's come home and has loved on your mother or a family member and they did, took such good care of him or her, would I not tell someone about it? Do I need a slide with a, you know, USG, JNJ, Agidias and all that? Yeah, well, that's important, right? But my word is my bond. So if I tell someone, this one, you will not regret. Imagine what would happen to Naomi and her, I don't want to call it business because you're really transforming and improving health outcomes. That's what we're talking about today. So even that goes a long way beyond just what you're talking about here. Nicholas, you wanted to add something? Yes, and I think it really requires one or two or three businesses to break through to some sense of scale. And, and perhaps scale also means beyond a particular country. And then people begin and be recognized and be, people begin to be proud of it. Um, so I'm sorry that my examples are not health examples, but um, I'm going to use a Guatemalan example, which is Gallo chicken. So Gallo is um, the really Kentucky fried chicken of, of Guatemala. And it started as a very small business in Guatemala. And it's now across Central America. Uh, and it's just entering the American market, because of course America has a lot of uh, Hispanic community. 
and and it's 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 just transformed the way in which Guatemalans will think about at least one of their businesses and one of their countries. And if you fly from Guatemala to the US, you see people smuggling gallo chicken onto the plane <laughs> to give to give to their to their relatives uh, uh, back home because it's so popular. And and Guatemala is a small country, and and um, you know, and and has all sorts of challenges attached to it. Um, but um, there are two or three firms like that um, in the food space in Guatemala that have genuinely transformed people's sense of what is possible in Guatemala, which has then led to a whole chain of other businesses growing up uh, behind them. Wow, amazing. Things that you could borrow outside of healthcare, you know. So thank you. I don't know if there's one last burning question. I, we, had, we need to finish off by 5.30 and I don't want to keep you any longer. Has it been interesting? Do you feel engaged? Are we answering your questions? So before we wrap up, it would be nice to just hear some parting shots from each one of the panelists who've done an awesome job. Have they not? Can we show them that? <laughs> Great. So I want to start with the lady in the room, please. Uh, Naom, we'll start with you. And then we'll come to Nicholas, Emmanuel, and then go back to the other side. Uh, next time, are we balancing this? Yes. We have to. <laughs> They're sitting here in the audience. <laughs> When I saw this, I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> we would sue you. <laughs> yeah, you have work to do. Uh, so um, in all that we have uh, been speaking about, I, I just feel like uh, what you should take home is that uh, the problems everyone here is solving, uh, problems that have existed for ages, for, for a very long time. And so we, if we want to do it alone, uh, we are not going to really... Uh, make a change. Uh, and so I'm always speaking about collaborations, collaborations because of what I have seen them do. A prime example is uh, the collaboration we have had with a telemedicine platform uh, called MDactari, where Benake has the patients and uh, they have the patients who would like to speak to their doctors online. Uh, but we do not have the platform. But MDactari has a very good platform. So we, we are not going to use our very limited resources to build the platform. Instead, we go and speak to MDactari to offer this service to, to our patients. Another uh, prime example is through Zuri Health, who are now doing uh, blood tests and, uh, and uh, phlebotomy services at home for our patients, making it easier to offer more value to the patients. So if there's anything you take home is that collaborations with the key uh, players in the market, even without, you know, without the, 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 the space, the confines of the healthcare space, will really uh, lead us to achieving truly sustainable health and social and economic outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Nicholas. Um, well, I just wanted to, two things, really. So one was just to address the sort of systems change question. And yes, systems changed often by, um, if you like, acts from above and acts of collaboration. Um, but they also require models which are growing from below. And these two things often um, don't always come together at the same time in the same context. Um, and they're slow and steady, and it's always a spiral. So it's always a process of change. And as we, as we, we heard uh, from David, um, even healthcare systems in what ap appear to be very sophisticated healthcare systems actually need to be rethought and reimagined uh, consistently and continuously. Um, the second, and so, so, so though I think collaboration is incredibly important, I think thinking about systems change is very important. I also think it's very important to keep doing what it is you love and understand and can do to make your best contribution to that system, even if some of the aspects of the system are indeed somewhat weighted uh, against you, they will change, um, and they'll change partly because you've been able to navigate your way through uh, in spite of the system as well as uh, because of it. Um, and then I just want to just quickly sing Phil Grow Africa's praises. Uh, so we've, we've, we've supported um, hundreds of organizations over the last 10 years in business development services. We've looked at uh, what makes for good quality business development services and high impact. Uh, we've benchmarked uh, those partners against one another. And we can safely say that Vilgo Africa has one of our green dots on our, on our board as a high performing organization.
Thank you very much. Um, so I want to speak to the ladies in the, in the house. Uh, you know, medical device development is something that, um, you know, basically is left out for, for men. But I just want to make uh, this clear that, ladies, you have the potential and you can really, um, you know, do it. So let nobody tell you that, you know what, you can't, you can't make it because there's, there's, there's nothing that um, uh, men are doing in the medical device industry that you can do. So that really um, shouldn't be um, anywhere uh, as, as a barrier. And lastly, I'll, I want to uh, appreciate Vilgo Africa and congratulate you upon celebrating the seven years of existence. This, the impact that you have created is really felt um, not only in Uganda, but you know, globally. Thank you very much. Thank you. George? Thank you. Um, I mean, this is my first time uh, at Sandcalp, uh, and I have to say it's been, and my first day obviously, uh, it's been quite an amazing, amazing experience uh, to have a conference where almost half, I think, of the attendees are entrepreneurs is unbelievable. Um, and I've had so many uh, amazing conversations already uh, so far today. Um, hopefully those conversations will actually lead to something further but to my mind it's 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 what in the short time that I'm in working on impact investing within J&J &J and kind of learning I mean it's the it's the ecosystem that's evolving I'm seeing more and more investors I mean there's some statistics out there in terms of the actual dollars that are used for impact investing that runs to I can't remember like two billion or whatever the number is but of that uh, there's something like seven percent is actually uh, set aside for health impact investing. So I really welcome uh, new players coming into that space. I think you know when we started out in this sort of journey, there was this sort of the, the thesis was a simple one: is to prove that impact investing in healthcare actually does actually work. Uh, I don't think we're naive enough five years or six years into that to actually say, yeah, we've proven it. But I mean, what's rewarding to sort of see is that there are more players in this sort of space with investing. But the actual amount of uh, opportunities and entrepreneurs that are coming to the surface um, is actually a, is, is an incredible and wonderful sort of thing to see and it certainly makes my job very 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 easy um, what I would say I mean just I was uh, going to touch on the, the earlier conversation uh, and uh, around uh, um, this kind of mindset shift around if something is manufactured in Kenya well you know that's not going to be you're going to pick something from somewhere else but I mean I've having conversations with two diagnostic companies who are in trials with the NHS for their solution. So, I mean, why can more and more Kenyan organizations or Nigerian organizations or wherever they're from do exactly the same? Because that's, that's what's going to happen. And when you do that, and, and yeah, thanks to say, it's nice to say things, you're going to have J&J &J or, or Boring or on your, or your pitch decks and stuff like that. But I mean, those sort of things become the real sort of proof points. They bring that sort of self-belief. They kind of help to sort of sell the message and everything else. So more and more of that certainly is going to be welcome. And then lastly, I think, uh, you know, on our journey to kind of get where we were, we were lucky enough to partner with Vilgro on an accelerator just over a year ago. Uh, and we've been introduced to some amazing entrepreneurs and you know following on from that we're actually in the middle of our, of our second one but it's been a, an amazing partnership they've been wonderful guys uh, and they make life for us uh, very very easy in a specific sort of area where we have very little sort of uh, expertise and whatever so truly welcome that kind of that partnership and what it brings to us so thank you thank you thank you so much actually to be open, this is my first time to Kenya, and the Thank credit you. comes to, Vil to Vilgro for having brought me to Kenya, and uh, it is my first time to attend such a summit. What I can only say is that uh, changing the sustainability in health care is not only one man's stand. All of us are involved coming to a service provider, coming to the entrepreneur, and you who is coming to get the service. We have to work together and then we change the perspective in which we are seeing this healthcare to what we want it to be. Thank you so much. Thanks, George. I think for me this is a surreal moment uh, where we get to be in the same panel with uh, our supporters and funders, our entrepreneurs, and end users. Uh, 
and I hope for you, Daktari, that the, the innovations that people like Emmanuel are working on will make your life easier when it comes now to clinical practice. And that will be our joy when we see that first patient using our device. I think we're gonna celebrate together. Um, the other thing is, if you haven't downloaded the impact report, there's a QR code right to my left here. You just scan with your phone. It's gonna lead you to a PDF. Just go there and see examples of others that are trying to change healthcare systems in different countries in Africa. And you might get inspired to also try something uh, in your own country, in your own county, and we'll be happy to support you. The other way you can get involved with us is mentorship, right? Uh, as I said, funding is, the, is, is not our biggest value add. Our biggest value add is technical assistance, which most of the time is offered through mentors. And you don't have to be a healthcare expert. You saw like the insights Nicholas shared from outside healthcare and how that opens your brain and helps you think outside the box when it comes to healthcare. So you might be a logistics expert, you might be a, a FinTech expert. We like those diverse skill sets, operations expert. Those are the kind of skills that when you build those around our entrepreneurs, then they, be, they become successful. So our call for mentors will be out shortly. I think in the next couple of weeks, you can sign up. Um, and the, the other one is you can also enjoy invest in some of our startups. As you look at the impact report, you'll see that our companies raised $22 million of follow-on funding. And we only put in about $2 million, so about 11x leverage. That means that uh, if you have two cars, you can sell one and put 5,000 in, in one of the startups. That, if that grows 10x, you see, you, you end up with 50,000 more. Uh, it's, it's always risky, uh, I have to warn you, you might lose all your money, but that's one way <laughs> to get involved. <laughs> um, because we can not all of us become inventors, right? Uh, so if, if, if you want to play a role in healthcare or in any entrepreneurship in general and you don't have time bandwidth, one way is to just invest, invest small checks to some of the startups. Um, other than that, we, we look forward to interacting more at the happy hour and uh, see you there and exchange a few business cards and see you again next year. I think I'll take on the homework by Paul from Boringa. How can we have a systemic level kind of discussion around healthcare? Uh, and I think that's something we will all invite you back to once we, we have that figured out. Thank you again for, 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 for your audience and for active participation. Thank you. Thank you, Wilfred. Uh, please, let's give them a round of applause. Okay. Great. So we started by talking about transformative healthcare business models. Is what Benaki are doing transformative? Is it impactful? Is it the same thing for Emmanuel and George? Please, a round of applause for them. But even more so, if they had not brought their ideas to the table and they had impact investors, you know, like J&J &J, uh, there, uh, we have, you know, uh, David and Nicholas. Thank you for the business development. We think we know our audience, then we realize, Allah, we don't know them, actually. We need to go and speak to Nicholas to find out what is it that we are missing. And Bill Grow, Asante Sana. Without you as accelerators, you know, uh, incubators, it would be so difficult for... Uh, our entrepreneurs here to grow. So a round of applause for everybody on the panel, please. <laughs> so we are finishing off, and uh, as Wilfred has said, we do have a happy hour. We have kept you until 5.30. I don't know what time it is where you come from, but now it's time to celebrate. And uh, before we do that, we are going to play one short video, and then I'll hand it over to Rob. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Naida from Vilgro Africa and we are so excited to announce the launch of our 7th year impact report. We are an incubator and an impact investor supporting emerging businesses in health and life sciences. This impact report celebrating our 7th birthday highlights the many innovators we have worked with, the end users who are benefiting from their services and products and the partners who have come alongside us to make our work possible. If you are an innovator or are interested in working with us as a funder, mentor or implementing partner, please reach out. We are always looking for more opportunities to collaborate and move Africa forward together.
Be sure to download the impact report from our website.